Hello, welcome to the Introduction to Proofs video, where this title is a lie. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. I am currently narrating this video to you. The learning objectives for this video that you're listening to are, by the end of this video, you should be able to read all of these learning objectives, including this one. You should be able to state a deep mathematical result that relies on Russell's paradox. And you should be able to not accomplish this third learning objective. The motivation for this is, this is the motivation for self-reference and Cantor's theorem. The proof of that and this motivation both use self-reference. Many other motivation blocks and narrations and theorems in math and computer science also use self-reference. We're going to look at um, many examples of paradoxes of self-reference. The first example is called the Barber's Paradox. In the town of Snrub, there is a male barber whose job is to shave every man who does not shave themselves, and only those people. So the question is simple, does this barber shave himself? Take a moment to think about this. So let's answer this question. So if the answer is no, the barber does not shave himself, then it's his job to shave himself, because he shaves everyone who doesn't shave themselves. So that's his job. So if he doesn't shave himself, then he does. And if he does shave himself, then he's breaking his commitment to shave only those people who don't shave themselves. Right? Right here it says only the people who don't shave themselves get shaved by the barber. So if the barber shaves himself, he's breaking this commitment. So if he doesn't shave himself, he does. And if he does, he doesn't. So this is a contradiction, or what we call a paradox. So you should work through this again. Remember that it's phrased as a question, a yes-no question. So the answer is either yes or no, and in both cases you get the opposite thing happening. Now let's look at self-referential words. So a word is called autological if it describes itself. So for example, the word noun is a noun, it describes itself, and polysyllabic, which means having more than one syllable, has more than one syllable, polysyllabic. So it, both noun and polysyllabic are autological words. What's the opposite of this? A word is called heterological if it does not describe itself. So for example, long is not a long word, and monosyllabic, meaning having only one syllable, has more than one syllable. So long and monosyllabic don't describe themselves, they're heterological words. Take a moment to think about other autological and heterological words. Can you think of any words that describe themselves or don't describe themselves? Now here's our main question. Is the word heterological a heterological word? Take a moment to think through this. So let's answer it. It's either a yes or no answer. So if the answer is no, that means that it is not a heterological word, so it means it's an autological word. And autological words describe themselves. Since they describe themselves, and the word is heterological, it must itself be heterological. So the answer is if no, then yes. Okay, well, let's answer it. What if the answer is yes? So if the answer is yes, then it satisfies its own definition, which means it doesn't describe itself. So the answer is no. So it's a yes or no question, and if no, then yes, and if yes, then no. Again, we have a contradiction or a paradox. Let's look at another example. This is called Russell's paradox. Russell was a mathematician and philosopher in the early 20th century. Let R be the collection of all sets that do not contain themselves as elements. So in set builder notation, you might write, write it like this. R is the set of all X such that X is not an element of X. Now this is a little bit weird, so let's look at some examples. The set one, two, three is not an element of itself because there's only three things in here, one, two, and three, and none of them are the full set. So this gives us an example of 
1, 2, 3 is in R. Almost every set you think of will satisfy this. So let's think of the question, is R an element of R? Perfectly reasonable question. It's either yes or no. So if, it's, if the answer is no, that means that it uh, is not an element of R, which means that R is in R. And the answer, if yes, then that means that it satisfies this property right here, which means that it's not an element of itself. So if it's not, then it is, and if it is, then it isn't. This is again a contradiction or a paradox. So we conclude from this that there's no set of all sets. Um, there's some formal thing going on here, which is, is this construction even allowed? Well, it's allowed if you have a set of all sets. So this is actually a complicated proof by contradiction that there is no set of all sets. The next one is the halting problem. So is there a computer program or a Python program that can detect whether any code will halt, eventually finish running, or have an infinite loop? So you might imagine that as you're working on a coding project, you might want to know, will it have an endless loop in it? And it would be very great to have a website that you could just plug in your code and it would tell you whether it would run forever or whether it will finish. It turns out that this is a very uh, hard problem. It's an impossible problem. No such program can exist. Finally, let's look at Gödel's incompleteness theorem. So it starts with a pretty simple question. Does every true statement in mathematics have a proof? In this course, we've, we often associated proof with truth. Turns out, Gödel answered, the answer is no. There are true statements that have no proof. And this is kind of mind boggling. It says that there are things that are true for reasons other than proof. And that might be a little bit unsettling. Gödel was a mathematician in the early 20th century, uh, after uh, Russell and after Cantor. If you're interested in this type of stuff about self-recursion and Gödel's incompleteness theorem and the halting problem, here are three books that you can read uh, that are all very interesting. The first one is called Gödel Escherbach, An Eternal Golden Braid. It's a very famous book and it's one that many computer scientists read. Uh, Gödel is a mathematician that we talked about. Escher is an artist who had lots of self-referential and impossible paintings. And Bach was the composer uh, who you know. Gödel's proof was written in 1958. It's a short book that explains the essential parts of the proof of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It is written for non-math people, uh, so it doesn't get into like theorems and proofs, but it gives you the basic idea in a way that uh, will be understandable. And then finally, Logic Comics, An Epic Search for Truth, is a comic graphic novel uh, written about the events of the late 1900s and sorry, late 1800s and early 1900s, um, featuring Gödel and uh, Russell and Cantor and all those people about uh, the developments of all of these things. Let's take some time to reflect. In what ways are the self-reference examples similar to each other? Make your own self-reference paradox. And finally, don't reflect on this third point. There's nothing to learn in this third point. Thank you very much, and I am your narrator, Mike Polyuk.